Um, someone asked just a reminder about where I contrasted Jesus and Muhammad. I give the details of Muhammad's story in the third choice, but summarize it here, and I also contrast it with the life of Christ. And um, at the end of this session on dimitude, living under Islam, I'm going to lead you in some prayers as a kind of response, really, to the message. And, and they are also in this little booklet. Um, these two books, Revelation and the Third Choice, are available on Amazon. They can be easily ordered. But this one is not. It's only, it's only available here. Um, well, here we go. Islam, as we explained, means surrender or submission. But there are actually two kinds of submission. One is to surrender as a convert, or the other is to surrender by conquest, by, by agreeing to live under Islamic rule. And uh, the doctrine of conquest in Islam is based on some theological principles. One is that um, Islam is the original religion, as we saw, that Christians and Jews are people of the book. Um, and Muhammad is the ultimate guide and the final prophet. And true Christians and Jews will accept Islam and uh, follow Muhammad. The Quran also, uh, as we saw, says that Muslims are the best people and they have a destiny to rule mankind. And that um, uh, they, yeah, that they will have a destiny to rule. Now, the way in which this call to this destiny to command what's right and wrong and to rule mankind is realized in traditional Islamic teaching is through the, the, the institution of jihad, which is a, a mission to conquer. Uh, and I sort of skipped over that slide earlier, but um, the, basically the root comes from a word meaning to struggle. But in Islamic law, jihad is a term for military struggle against non-believers to impose Islam. That is a, as a word in Islam. So if you, if you looked in a, in a Sharia law manual on the chapter on jihad, it would be about military conquest and military battle procedures and so on. Now here's a, a ruling from Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, the, the Grand Mufti of the Sacred, the Sheikh of the Sacred Mosque, sorry, of Mecca, Abdullah bin Muhammad bin Hamid. Um, did a, a very important essay on jihad in the Quran, explaining what the Quran says about jihad. And he said at first, the, he summed it up by saying, at first the fighting was forbidden, that's in Mecca, then it was permitted, so Muhammad could fight under certain circumstances, and after that it was made obligatory, first against those who start fighting against you, so defensively, and then finally against all those who worship others alongside with Allah. That means literally all those, in effect, who are mushrik, who associate uh, with Allah including Christians and Jews. Now this really, if, if Islam is a system in, which includes this doctrine of bringing the world under submission either by conversion or by conquest, uh, what does it mean to be a non-Muslim living under Sharia conditions? And how are the conditions determined? Why is it so? That's what I'm going to explain to you today. Um, when Amrosi, the Bali bomber, uh, was convicted in the Balinese courtroom, he shouted out, remember Khaybar. He shouted that out in the courtroom. And it was reported on the front page of the Australian newspaper, and I think probably I was the only person in Australia who knew what he meant, but it was misspelt for one thing. But um, uh, it's very interesting that the fate of Jews and Christians and uh, lots of other religions were determined by Muhammad's example in the conquest of the Jews of Khaybar. Um, Muhammad had uh, earlier had some problems with the Jews. In Medina, they disagreed with him and wouldn't submit, and he expelled them tribe after tribe, and um, uh, the final tribe surrendered, and he killed the men and women, and sold, killed the men, sorry, and sold the women and children, or incorporated it into the families and lineages of the Muslims. Khaybar was a different place, mainly inhabited by Jews, uh, a fertile place, and it was attacked by Muhammad, told to embrace Islam. Muhammad explained before the attack that was the purpose, to call them to Islam. Many Jews were enslaved and killed. They walked through, worked through kind of fort by fort. But finally the rest surrendered and they argued to Muhammad that they, could, they should keep their Judaism and be allowed to look after the land. So a, a covenant of surrender was negotiated. I need to keep up my speed here. Covenant of surrender was negotiated. <clears throat> and this covenant is called a Dhimma Pact. The Arabic term dhimma means a pact of liability, or sometimes it's called a pact of protection. It involves submission to Muslims for the people of the book only, strictly speaking, in Islamic law, that is, Jews and Christians and others that were given that status, not available for pagan Arabs. 
And converts to Islam would be free from the status, so that was a choice to become a Muslim as well. And this Dhimma Pact fixes the legal, social, political role of Christians and Jews living under Islam. I call my book the third choice because the three choices are firstly to convert to Islam, or second the sword, or the third is to surrender and live as a dhimmi under Islamic rule. So the book is about the third choice. Um, when uh, Pope Benedict gave a speech some years ago in Regensburg in Germany, he sort of intimated that Islam was spread by force, and the Chief Justice of Saudi Arabia issued a press release saying it's not fair or right to say that Islam was spread by force because there was a third choice. And the third choice was uh, to surrender. So that was the reason why it wasn't the spreading by force. Uh, that's why I called the book The Third Choice. So um, uh, it's based on the Quran as well as the example of Muhammad. They work together in this case. And there's a particular verse, a famous verse. This is the last chapter of the Quran. So remember, the later verses tend to have authority over the earlier ones. Uh, Surah 9, 29, fight against such of those that have been given the scripture, that's the Jews and Christians including them, as believe not in Allah nor the last day, well, I do believe in Allah on the last day, and forbid not that which Allah has forbidden by his messenger. Well, that's certainly me. You know, I don't forbid what Muhammad has forbidden. That is, I don't follow his guidance. And follow not the religion of truth. Well, that's Islam. So this is describing people, Jews and Christians and others, who refuse to convert to Islam. Fight them until they pay the jizya, the tribute, readily being humbled. Uh, the Arabic word means to be, to be small, made small. So there's two aspects. One is this payment of tribute and the humble, being humbled. So I'm going to speak about both those and unpack them for you. A dhimmi is someone who uh, lives under a dhimma pact. And technically, in Islamic law, apart from temporary visitors or merchants or whatever, all of the people who are permanently living under Islamic rule who aren't Muslims have to be dhimmis. It's the only way you're allowed to be under an Islamic system. Um, and this is the classical system of Islamic law. The status lasts from generation to generation, so the Jewish community can keep its Judaism uh, actually until Jesus returns. He will stop this system uh, and bring it to an end. It's linked to jihad, so it's a concession allowing Jews, Christians and others to keep their religion after jihad conquest, provided that they pay compensation in terms of the tribute and also are humbled. Um, and as I said, there are two other choices, so it's regarded in Islamic law as a choice, that is, non-Muslims agree to this condition. Um, Dhimmi status is someone not a Muslim uh, living in Islamic, uh, under Islamic rule, subject to a Dhimma pact. Now, I'm going to unpack what it means to be living as a non-Muslim under Islam. Firstly, we'll look at the tax, and then we'll look at the, the humbled. The tax jizya is an Arabic word meaning reparations or compensation. And it's levied on dhimmis as an annual, annual head tax for the males. So each individual adult male traditionally used to have to pay this. Uh, and the money is used for the benefit of the Islamic community. The meaning of the tax is that it's a, it's, a, it's a satisfaction or a redemption of your blood. The idea derives from Arab traditional law that if you conquered an enemy and let them live, they owed you their life and their possessions because you could have taken those rightfully because you, you beat them. And they can compensate you for that. So here's one commentator from the 19th century in Algeria. He said the jizya is a satisfaction for their blood. It said it has sufficed to compensate for their not being slain. Its purpose is to substitute for the duties, this is an ob obligation upon Muslims, of killing and of slavery. It's for the benefit of Muslims. I've looked through many commentaries on this verse, uh, and uh, this is the general view, that the jizya payment is a compensation or a redemption payment, whereby you redeem your head. Uh, let's look at the description of the payment of the tax from, the, from 15th century Morocco. This is by a Muslim scholar. On the day of payment, the dhimmi shall be assembled in a public place. They should be standing there waiting in the lowest and the dirtiest place. The acting officials representing the law shall be placed above them and shall adopt a threatening attitude so that it seems to them as well as to the others that our object is to degrade them by pretending to take their possessions. They will realize that we are doing them a favor in accepting from them the jizya and letting them go free. Then they shall be dragged one by one for the exacting of payment. When paying, the dhimmi will receive a blow and will be thrown to us on one side so that he'll think that he has escaped the sword through this. This is the way that the friends of the Lord, that is Muhammad, of the first and the last generations, 
will act towards their infidel enemies, for might belongs to Allah, to his apostle, and to the believers. Now this is from 15th century Morocco. It describes a ritual in which the Jews, there were no Christians left in Morocco by that time, uh, when the men are paying the tax each year, they're struck on the head, it really is a symbolism of decapitation, and thrown aside as if they'd been killed. Um, and they are taught through this that they have escaped with their heads. So it's a ritual death um, as part of uh, payment of the tax. It's a bit like a blood oath, like cross my heart and hope to die. I'll pay my tax, you hit me on the head, and I remember why I'm paying my tax. You know What will happen to me if I don't pay the tax or if I don't keep any of the rules of the pact? Um, someone called William Eaton did a survey of the Turkish Empire in 1799, published it, and he said the very words of the formula, this is the words of the ritual, that were given to the Christian subjects on paying the tax, so what's said to them, import, that means that the sum of money received is taken as compensation for being permitted to wear their heads that year. So this is the idea that you're um, buying back your life for another year. Um, this is quite an interesting concept, and uh, uh, one of the questions that arise if you strike a text like that is, is it representative? Is this just an aberration? Did they just do this in Morocco or in 8th century Turkey or something? Interestingly, in Morocco, there was an American ship's captain, James Riley, who was shipwrecked in Morocco and then <coughs> enslaved and later ransomed, and he describes the Jews of Morocco going through this ritual in the 18, around about 1820. And then um, an Italian Jew in the 1890s visited Morocco and describes the same ritual, payment of the tax and the bullet, two blows on the neck, one here and one here. So it went on for a long time. Um, and in fact, I made a bit of a, a study of this over 10 years. No one's really described this ritual before in the detail that I have in the third choice. And I found uh, around 30 references to the ritual that involved the blow on the neck or the head. Um, the 8th century, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 18th, 17th, 20th century. And from Persia, Syria, um, Anatolia, that's in Turkey, um, Andalusia, Spain, Egypt, Ottoman Turkey, uh, um, Morocco, uh, Yemen, uh, Bukhara is Central Asia, Iran, Tunisia, Afghanistan. This, is this ritual is reported from the Jews of Afghanistan were paying the Jews here in the 1950s before they went to Israel. So it went on for a very long time across a vast period of, of time and space. Um, there are many commentaries that explain the meaning of the payment of the tax. It would have applied across India as well, because India was conquered. Hungary was under Islam for a period. Um, large parts of Europe, in fact. Um, Sicily, uh, large areas on the southern coast of France and uh, Italy, Andalusia. Ibn Kathir, I mention him because you can look him up for yourself, and he's very widely used by Muslims. Paying jizya is a sign of kufr. It's quite an offensive term and disgrace. Allah said, Unless, until they pay the jizya, that is, if they don't choose to embrace Islam, with willing submission, that is, in defeat and subservience, and feel themselves subdued, that is, disgraced, humiliated, and belittled. Therefore, Muslims are not allowed to honor the people of the them or elevate them above the Muslims, for they are miserable, disgraced, and humiliated. Muslim recorded, sorry, I've got to keep up, that from Abu Hurairah, that the Prophet said, do not initiate the salam to the Jews and the Christians, that is, don't greet them with peace. And if you meet them in a road, force them to its narrowest alley. So that's a hadith. This is why the leader of the faithful, Umar bin al-Khattab, this is the second caliph, soon after Muhammad, may Allah be pleased with him, demanded his well-known conditions be met by Christians. These conditions that ensured their continued humiliation, degradation, and disgrace. So what we're going to look at now, we've just looked at the payment of the tax and its symbolism as a redemption of your life. What we're going to look at now is the laws that apply in Islamic law to non-Muslims living under Islam. And I've made a bit of a list here, but there's a more exhaustive list in the third choice. Under Islam, any Muslim who converts to Christianity or Judaism is subject to the death penalty. Uh, conversions between faiths have generally been forbidden. It's forbidden to try to convert a Muslim or to hinder a dhimmi from entering Islam. A Muslim may marry a Christian or a Jewish woman, but their children become Muslims. It's uh, forbidden for a Muslim woman to marry a Christian or a Jewish man. These are all 
part of the conditions of the Treaty of Surrender. So if you break any of these laws, you're violating your Pact of Surrender. Anyone who converts to Islam gains preferential inheritance rights within the family. Um, no new churches are allowed to be built after conquest. Damaged churches not allowed to be repaired. Dhimmi houses have to be smaller and lower than Muslim houses. If you ever visit the Jewish quarter in parts of Spain from the Muslim period, you'll see the houses are very small houses. It wasn't that the Jews were very short people at that time. Um, Dhimmis have to dress differently and more poorly than Muslims. A Dhimmi has to vacate his seat for a Muslim. Um, Dhimmis have to adopt a humble appearance, uh, forbidden to raise a hand against a Muslim, forbidden to curse a Muslim, you couldn't own or carry arms. Um, and some important legal provisions, uh, the blood of a Muslim is not equal to the blood of a Dhimmi. So murder of a Muslim is punished by death, but Sharia law states that no Muslim can be put to death for killing a non-Muslim. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote, Jews and Christians do not believe in Muhammad and Islam, so their blood and the Muslim's blood cannot be equal. Today in Saudi Arabia they have tables to show the value of the blood of Hindus, Christians, um, Saudis, Muslims and so on, and with ascending scales. Men are more than women and you know, Muslims more than Christians, Christians more than Hindus and so on. If uh, a dhimmi kills uh, another dhimmi and converts to Islam, you would escape the, 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 pe the pe penalty as well. Um, Christians are not allowed to hold public office or exercise authority over Muslims. I'll come back to that point later. This is a very important point. Dhimmi testimony is not valid against a Muslim. It, this applies throughout really the whole of the Islamic world until the modern period. Um, this is, makes non-Muslims very vulnerable. If a Christian is accused by a Muslim of a capital offence, such as trying to convert a Muslim or any of the pact violations, your own testimony is not valid in your defence. Uh, this also often means that Christians or non-Muslims have to bribe Muslims to be their witnesses in court cases. Uh, dhimmis have to house and feed Muslim soldiers to help the jihad. Dhimmis are forbidden from any public display of their religion, no crosses, funeral processions, no bells, no loud singing. When Hamas took over Gaza, um, the, the, the Catholics there stopped ringing bells. Um, there was a, a very interesting BBC story uh, I wrote about on my blog where um, a reporter was visiting Christmas service and a nun was sitting in the corner of the church playing a cassette tape with bells very quietly uh, because they, they, it, was, it was interesting, it was presented as, a, as the Christians being sensitive to the Muslim neighbours that it might upset them but actually what had happened was that uh, Hamas has say, stated very clearly that it wants to introduce the dimmer laws and that the church had uh, been informed that they couldn't ring their bells or they knew it anyway. Um, no, yeah, no public display. If you see photographs of Jerusalem from the 19th century under Islamic rule, under Turkish rule, there are no crosses on any of the churches. They only appear later when um, Jerusalem is uh, liberated and then it comes under British and then, then Israeli rule, the, the, the crosses come back again. Um, not allowed to ride horses, not allowed to teach children about Islam. Um, Distinctive clothing, coloured patches invented under Islam. The yellow patches for Jews was a medieval Muslim invention. Um, this is a report from one of these golden age periods in, in Andalusia. Compa the Qadi compelled the Dhimmis to wear upon their shoulders a patch of white cloth that bore the image of an ape for the Jews and a pig for the Christians and to nail onto their doors a board bearing the sign of a monkey. Um, a distinctive sign must be imposed upon them in order that they may be recognised and this will be for them a form of disgrace, said Ibn Andu Ardun. Um, Muhammad said uh, those who look alike are the same, so that is interpreted to mean that Muslim, Jews should be different uh, and Christians should wear different clothes, so they might be required to wear different coloured shoes or a special belt or other forms of distinctive dress. Even in the baths, the public baths, when you'd normally be naked, they were required to wear a bell around their ankle or a seal around their neck. Uh, in the early centuries, usually the dhimmis had a neck seal to show that they'd paid their tax. So you'd seal your neck to show it was paid for for a year. Um, many other practices, not part of Islamic law, but would often be local practices that were easily developed because of the general conditions, such as the custom of throwing stones at non-Muslims. Um, this is reported in um, the 19th century in Jerusalem and areas around there. Very common for boys to throw stones at Jews. Um, 
This is one of the symbolic sig meanings of the Intifada, where the, the, the Palestinian boys throw stones at the IDF. This is a, a, a very long-standing custom, really, of treating non-Muslims uh, under Islamic rule. Um, curses, training children to curse non-Muslims. A report from Lane in 1836, abduction of orphaned Yemeni Jewish children. In, in Yemen, up until the time when most of the Jews left, uh, if a Jewish child was orphaned, they had to be handed over to the Muslim authorities to be brought up as a Muslim. And um, under the Turks, they systematized this and used to take regularly uh, children. In fact, the third choice, this is, a, this is a beautiful painting of the collection of Christian children to be slaves in the uh, Sultan's army. Uh, somewhere in the Balkans. They would be forcibly converted and then used as soldiers. Um, now, one thing that's important about all these regulations, there's a few things that are important. Um, one is to note that the full DIMI system is not applying at present in any country. There's no kind of recognized nation that applies the Jizya tax today. Um, Insurgents in Iraq have imposed it on local Christians. The Taliban's brought it back. Um, people do apply it in, in parts, remote parts of Egypt, and it's been reported from Yemen, and, and radicals keep saying it should be brought back. But it's actually not part of any official government system. But that sense of indebtedness of owing your life to the Muslims, and also a lot of these laws apply in one form or another. For example, in Egypt, it used to be the case that in order to repair a church, you had to get presidential approval because it was a concession and that the Dimma Pact was against it. If you had to fix your urinal, you needed the president's signature. And there have been cases where churches have been attacked and people have been killed because a church did a repair without an official um, permission. And uh, there's a church, a cathedral south of Cairo just recently, uh, they got permission to demolish their old unsatisfactory structure and rebuild, but as soon as they demolished it, the, um, the, the governor, it's now a governor level approval, he withdrew the permission. So they've demolished their building and now they can't rebuild it because he won't give them permission. In Indonesia, very hard sometimes to get permits. Um, I remember a church was burnt down in Aceh and I said to them, are you rebuilding? They said, we haven't got permit to do that. So they're meeting in the garage. Um, it's a, it's a very common problem. Um, and many other of these, these rules as well. There are restrictions in Egypt on Christians holding high office. The middle of the, 19, uh, the 20th century in Egypt was much different. It was a much more secular period and Christians were very much in evidence in, in public life and in leadership. Um, but they've been gradually pushed out as the Islamic revival has uh, gained, gained momentum in Egypt. And it's, it's easier to be a primary school teacher than a secondary school teacher if you're a Christian. For example, the more senior the position, the harder it is to be in it. It would be the same in, in uh, the armed forces or in other areas of public service. Now, one thing I want to say about all these laws is that there is a, is, there is a condition attached to them, um, that these are part of the pact of surrender. And if you break any of the laws, the punishment is the surrender is null and void, and the war continues. So jihad restarts. And um, I'll take you to a few sources that explain this principle. Um, this is in the Pact of Umar, a very early version of a Dhimma Pact, and the Christians are speaking. These are the conditions we set for, against ourselves and followers of our religion in return for safety and protection. So it's a liability we've accepted. If we break any of these promises that we set out for your benefit against ourselves, then our Dhimma is broken and you're allowed to do with us what you're allowed to do with people of defiance and rebellion. So basically, you can start the jihad against us if we break any of these laws. So if we witness to a, a Muslim about Christ, you can treat us as, as objects of jihad. Ibn Qudama, a, 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 a common, a, a, an Islamic authority, said that a protected person who violates his protection agreement, whether by refusing to pay the tribute or to submit to the laws of the community, makes his person and goods halal. Now, halal food means you can eat it, but if someone's life is halal, it means you can take the life. It's not a crime to kill them or to take their property. So they're fair game. Um, and the three main consequences of a pact violation, are uh, that these are part of the institution of Islamic Jihad, are uh, looting, uh, taking booty. As I said, Muhammad said he's the first prophet to be given permission to take booty. And rape and enslavement. Um, Islamic law says that when a woman is taken captive, she is 
sexually available to her captor. And if she's already married, then that is automatically divorced under Sharia law by virtue of being taken captive. So her captor's not committing adultery if he has sex with her. Um, and Or death, so men would be killed. So what you'll see again and again down through history is examples where um, uh, pact violations, perceived or real, have resulted in attacks with these characteristics. And I'll mention a few of them. Um, the massacre of the Jews of Granada in 1066 was triggered off because the, 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 the Muslim leader had appointed Jews to be grand viziers of the city. So he used Jews in authority to help administer the city. Sometimes this is reported as a sign of Islamic tolerance that Jews or Christians rose to positions of great authority. The problem was it was a pact violation and we have a record from Muslim sources of preaching in the mosque against the Jews because they weren't humbled enough resulting in this killing of the men and enslavement of the women and children. And I found some very interesting discussions by theologians that I've reported in the Third Choice where it says that if a, if, if a, if a Jew or a Christian or people of the book, they ra they're raised up to this level, then um, even if it's a Muslim that's appointed them to a high level, their pact of protection is, is violated. They have no more protection to have accepted such a role. Um, in Damascus, uh, there was also a massacre, all the Christians in Damascus, the men at least, um, and the trigger for that was that the Turks had abolished the Dima system formally around 1850, and they did that under pressure from the Europeans whose help they needed, and as part of the reform movement in Turkey. But the problem with that on the ground was that the local Muslims then took the view that non-Muslims were no longer protected, and their lives and their property were halal. They were available because they were no longer paying the jizya, and they were no longer inferior. So you give them equal rights, but equal rights means no protection. And uh, this is very well documented. There was an Englishman there in the town who documented the preaching in the mosque and the resulting attack. He apparently was safe. It was the local Christians that were attacked. Um, in fact, a number of very significant mission agencies derived out of caring for the refugees that were created by that famous incident. The, the, uh, the men were killed and the women and the children disappeared as slaves into the homes of uh, Muslims in the city and also the Bedouin around, around Damascus. Another problem is abduction of women and tolerance of attacks on non-Muslim women. Um, this is a rather subtle matter. Uh, technically it would be um, illegal and wrong under Sharia law to take the wife or a woman from one of the people of the book. They should be protected by virtue of their Dimmer pact. But the problem is that if the pact is broken or there's a violation, that protection would no longer exist and you'd be, uh, you'd be quite entitled to take the woman. So basically the Dhimmi community lives under the permanent threat of rape. And they know that and the Muslim community will know that as well. But if you live under the threat of lawful rape then you get a much higher incidence of unlawful rape. Because if you think uh, you know, that woman could be mine then maybe you just might take her anyway. And it's easy to blame, you know, to trump up a, an excuse for doing it. So, strictly speaking, it's against Islamic law, but it happens often uh, in history. And uh, there's a number of uh, reports that I include in the third choice explaining about how really terribly fearful uh, non-Muslim communities were about losing their women and then being taken. Um, there's another problem too, and that is that non-Muslim's testimony is not valid in Islamic law. Patrick Sugdao explains the difficult situation in Pakistan when women are kidnapped and they're then married and said to have converted to Islam. The problem, the problem then is um, that, uh, that when a woman marries, her husband becomes her guardian. And so he can choose to represent her in a court of law. She has no right to appear on her own. So if I'm the father and my daughter is taken by a Muslim and he takes her, marries her, then he'll come to me, if I go to him and I'll say, what have you done with my daughter? He said, she's become a Muslim. Firstly, you no longer have custody over her because you can't have a Muslim having guardianship over a non-Muslim in Islamic law. And secondly, the husband is now the legal guardian, so he will give testimony in court that the judge has to accept on her behalf. Um, and uh, Patrick Sudeau has explained this. This is a big problem in Egypt. There's been a lot of concentration and writing about the abduction of Coptic women who've, uh, uh, who've been taken. In fact, now the Islamic community is very upset about the Copts complaining about this. And they are, um, they are saying that the Coptic priests are kidnapping Muslim women when they take the women back. 
like they asked the Egyptian authorities to intervene on behalf of these women, the police might go in and find out that the woman actually is still a Christian and doesn't want to be in this situation. She hasn't agreed to the marriage. So the police might help the woman or, they, or the family somehow rescues her and then they'll keep her in a, mosque, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a monastery or a safe place. So now the Muslims are saying these are Muslim women who've been kidnapped by the Christians. And the Pope is being, the Coptic Pope is being described as an abductor and an abuser. And there have been, there've been protests in Egypt and the burning of effigies of the Pope. And uh, hatred of Christians is rising very high in Egypt because the Christians' attempt to rescue their women is bringing this attack. It's like you accuse the Christians of doing what you yourself have been doing. This is a, historically reported by many communities. I mention it because it's, it's such a complex issue. Um, in Australia, we had a case a few years back where it was reported in the paper that about 60 girls had been gang raped in Sydney by Lebanese Muslim boys. And a few of the girls had the courage to take it to court. And uh, many were shocked at how um, aggressive the families were uh, of the boys against the girls, uh, abusing them in the courts. Um, and the boys were sentenced to very long periods, the young men, uh, which the Muslim leaders complained about as being unjust and unfair. Um, the problem was, uh, strictly speaking, what the boys did, I mean, literally speaking, what the boys did was wrong in Islamic law. You can't just take women and do that. It's wrong in Islam. It's unjust. But the problem is they've grown up in a culture where the potential of kidnapping women, in, if there's a pact violation, if the Demi community steps out of line in any way, is part of culture. And because of the possibility of lawful rape, then it becomes part of an abusive system. And the boys, unfortunately, the men, take this culture to Australia. There have been reports of, of the percentage of rapists in Danish and Norwegian prisons, much higher proportion of men who are rapists from the Muslim community than other communities. You can imagine how hard it is to talk about this in the public forum. It sounds like you're a bigot or you hate Muslims if you're saying, um, you know, Muslim do this more than others? How can you talk like that? It sounds terrible. But there actually is a theological reason for it, for the practice, and it has to do with the dhimma system. And really to address it profoundly, you need to bring the system to the light and say it's not right. Let's renounce it and find a different way of living together. That has to be exposed in order to really deal with the root of the problem. Otherwise, it's there bubbling away and no one really acknowledges it, but that's the driver. That's the theological driver. Um, in 2005, there were riots in Taiba, a Palestinian village, and the trigger for that was that a Muslim girl had had a friendship with a Christian man, and the Muslims uh, ransacked the town, the Christian town, shouting, Allah o Akbar. Well, why? That's the looting response. One man had had a prohibited relationship, the protection no longer applied, you have an attack and loot the whole village. It's a collective response. That's another important principle that um, one person can break the pact, but the whole community suffers. It's a collective pact. Everyone has to keep the rules or everyone suffers. And there have been recent attacks, um, of the rumour of a, of a Coptic boy uh, molesting or um, attacking a, a, a Muslim girl resulted in the massacre of a number of Copts in Nag Hammadi in, in uh, Egypt in January. Again, a collective reprisal for a, a, a Vima pact violation and attacks on Christians in Iraq. They are considered to be traitors uh, with the uh, Christian soldiers as they're thought to be for the occupiers, and so they've suffered a lot. The, the, I have a story in um, a, a report in the third choice of a, of a reporter who went to an Anglican church there, uh, which is just full of women and children because the men have all been killed. Uh, and it's a very big problem amongst Christians uh, in areas where Muslims are fighting each other. That often, if the Christians are regarded as traitors and not not true to supporting the Muslims, helping the cause, then they can be very vulnerable. If, if Christians in Iraq have to guard their churches with guards, they'll usually have Muslim guards because Christians shouldn't wear, carry arms. That would uh, upset the Muslims and make them, uh, make them more aggressive. So it's a very, very far-reaching uh, consequences. Now, the system of slavery can produce racism that lasts well after slavery is abolished, and that's still a problem here. In, in the US uh, in some ways, although people have fought very hard to deal with it. But the dimmer system can produce a mentality or society of dimitude which can continue for a very long time. And uh, a long time after the dimmer is cancelled, the, 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 the culture continues. 
in, in Egypt today and also in Greece, if you strike someone on the neck, it's regarded as incredibly insulting. And the reason is that's like, you know, you are my dimmy, you know, I've got your head. Um, it's part of that ritual of surrender. Now, some of the Islamic scholars were quite specific about the psychology that this system was meant to produce in defeated people. And Mawardi, one of the scholars, said that the, the purpose of this system, or the intent of it, was to generate um, a really humility, humility and gratitude. Uh, humility because the jizya system is a sign of contempt, or gratitude because the Muslims have generously spared their life. So humility is an intended characteristic that this system produces. Even Ajiba, this is one of the passages that I had translated and published for the first time in the third choice, in a commentary in the 18th century, said, the dhimmi is commanded to put his soul, good fortune and desires to death. Above all, he should kill the love of life, leadership and honor. He is to invert the longings of his soul. He is to load it down more heavily than it can bear until it is completely submissive. Thereafter, nothing will be unbearable for him. He'll be indifferent to subjugation or might. Poverty and wealth will be the same. Praise and insult will be the same. Preventing and yielding will be the same. Lost and found will be the same. Then when all things are the same, the soul of the dhimmi will be submissive and yield willingly what it should give. So his analysis of the psychological intention of this system was to just be soul destroying, basically. The idea was that the dhimmi should have no personal desires or ambition, anything that would cause them not to be very, very quick and immediate in giving whatever the Muslims wanted from them. Now, one of the effects of the psychology of abuse is uh, collusion, identifying with your abuser, the Stockholm Syndrome, I suppose, or the abattered woman syndrome. You try and make yourself as inconspicuous as possible and to praise and serve your abuser, and this causes some real problems. Um, I go into it in more detail in the book, but there are many cases when Christians who are living under this problem will deny it and not accept it. I had a lovely passage, a quote from a Coptic, from a Muslim in Egypt, complaining that whenever there was an atrocity against Christians, um, Christian leaders would come out very rapidly and declare that this had absolutely nothing to do with Islam, and there'd be what he called lots of beard kissing, where the Muslim leaders and the Christian leaders would meet and kiss each other and hug, and there would be no resistance to the event. And this Muslim was very frustrated by that because he saw that it was actually radical Islam that was generating a lot of these events. Now, this raises a very difficult question related to what Diane said earlier about approaching Muslims in humility. Christ offers a model for Christians that they should serve their neighbor and subjugate their own needs in the process. Humility is the way of Christ. However, Islam interprets such service not as grace, but as a debt owed. The service is regarded as confirmation of Islam's destiny to rule. In this paradigm, aid becomes tribute and humility becomes humiliation. America's paying a lot of aid to Egypt. Is that aid or is it tribute? Because is Egypt is a potential hotbed of radicalism. Uh, these are very uh, complicated psychological dynamics. Um, Denial is one of the features of the Dhimmi condition. You deny that it's a problem. Palestinian Christians who are leaving the Palestinian areas will often blame Israel a lot more than acknowledging the, the threats that they're under from Pal Muslim Palestinians. That's much easier, safer for them. Uh, um, and um, there's a lot of, what I want to move into now is speak about how this mentality of gratitude and inferiority is shaping the West voluntarily dimitude status. We're adopting this as an as a, as a Islam policy for the West. If only we're dhimmis, then everything will be fine. Um, and I'll give you some leaders' statements. Tony Blair, the voices of extremism are no more representative of Islam than the use in times gone by of torture to force conversion to Christianity represented the teachings of Christ. So in one breath, he's um, criticizing himself and Christianity um, humbly and at the same time saying that Islam is not extreme. He's praising it and denying Islam is a problem. A very characteristic statement that you'd expect you know, a Coptic bishop or a leader of a, a, you know, a Christian leader in Pakistan or somewhere to say something like that if they were fighting for the survival of their people. Um, in South London, there was quite a few incidences of gangs targeting Christians. In Bradford, a Christian family converted from Islam and they had their lives threatened their car was burnt and they were threatened with violence. They went to see the Bishop of Bradford, the Anglican Bishop, 
And he said to them that the Diocese of the Anglican Church wouldn't welcome such converts into it. It's a very interesting statement because in, um, in, uh, in, in many Muslim countries, there's a great reluctance to welcome converts from Islam into churches because that's a pact violation. To help someone leave Islam is a breach of your security. And uh, it's dangerous to do that. So a number of people who have become, say, Christians in Egypt speak about how the churches will not have anything to do with them. It's quite dangerous. So what's happening here is the Bishop Bradford, having no idea really about Islam or, or the Dimitude, is acting like a conquered person in, in, in saying to these um, Christians, oh, you, you know, you're, you're, you must be something wrong with you that, you know, that you're under this threat. Silencing is a challenge to his one from Michigan. In June, four Christians were arrested by police for evangelizing Muslims at Dearborn at an Arab street festival. Now, evangelism is forbidden under the Dhimma system. They reported the police told them they'd have to be five blocks away to give out copies of the Gospel of John. It wasn't actually a religious festival, I believe, but an, Islam, but an Arab one. They were acquitted by a jury, and the Thomas Law Center, which represented them, said that their offense was they contravened an Islamic law which forbids Christians witnessing to Muslims. Well, that's true in an Islamic state. And, um, uh, Bob Onru said, jurors in Michigan have rejected, at least for now, the concept of a dhimmi status for Christians in the state of Michigan. Uh, this, cause, this sort of case would be brought as a, as a vilification issue or a disturbance of the peace issue. But its impact is to imply a sharia restriction and a dhimmi restriction on freedom of speech. So sometimes people call this sharia by stealth or backdoor sharia, where the psychology of defeat becomes, uh, comes in through a different pathway. Uh, I found uh, many examples of this. Um, the British police uh, used to require all their police to wear the British crown. And you can see a helmet there. And on top of the helmet, uh, on top of the crown, there's a, there's, a, there's a little cross. You can't really see it, um, but you see just up here, there's a little cross. It's actually a bit squished down. Um, where are we here? Yeah, a, that's actually a cross. And um, the police, Muslim police, couldn't, said they wouldn't do that because it offends them to wear a cross. It's a forbidden symbol for Muslims. Um, and the, the British accepted that, and they allowed the British police to wear helmets without the crown on it. And the problem with that, you might say, well, that's very accommodating. They're being very gracious, and it's multicultural, it's sensitive, you know. But the problem is the crown is the symbol of British sovereignty. It's a sign that everyone is under one rule and under one law. And surrendering that sign is a big symbol. It's a big change. I call that self-rejection. It's like the British rejecting their own identity. Uh, they're not standing up for themselves. Grateful praise is another common feature. Um, Sarkozy, President of France, went to Saudi Arabia where he was given the sword, second choice. And uh, he said, um, Islam is one of the greatest and most beautiful civilizations the world has known. He praised Islam. People like this write speeches that their speech writers help them write, uh, and they, they try to communicate words that will have the maximum positive impact on their hearers. And he knew that Muslim, his Muslim audience would react very favorably to this statement. Um, a President Obama said, we will convey our deep appreciation for the Islamic faith, this was in Turkey, which has done so much over the centuries to shape the world, including in my own country. So he's saying that um, Americans, in a sense, owe a debt, a civilizational debt to Islam for its positive contribution to shaping the nation. And that sense of indebtedness, I think, as a psychological tray, is resulting from or shaped by that, the dhimmi system, where the dhimmi is indebted for his very life, in fact, for everything. And it becomes a kind of, uh, it transforms and influence discourse uh, in many other spheres as well. Now, very interestingly, that it, it, oh, here's another example. Mary Robinson was the, um, we lost a page here, but that's all right. Mary Robinson was the president of Ireland and head of the Uni Human Rights Commission of the United Nations. She gave a speech at the UN which said, it's important to recognize the greatness of Islam, its civilizations, and its immense contribution to the richness of the human experience, not only through profound belief in theology, but also through the sciences, literature, and art. 
No one can deny that at its core Islam is entirely consonant in agreement with the principle of fundamental human rights, including human dignity, tolerance, solidarity and equality. Numerous passages from the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad will testify to this. No one can deny from a historical perspective the revolutionary force that is Islam, which bestowed rights upon women and children long before similar recognition was afforded in other civilizations. And no one can deny the acceptance of the universality of human rights by Islamic states. What's really, there's a number of very interesting themes that come through in that, in that statement. One is, be quiet if you disagree. You can't deny this. It, it's like it's a, it's a refusal of any contrary voice. Another is uh, the, the subtle sense of gratitude, like Islam bestowed rights on women long before anyone else had them. I think he's probably referring to the rule that they introduced that you shouldn't put female babies to death or something like that. Actually, Christians had already done that centuries before. But um, So she's a woman and a Christian woman from a, well, Christian background, from a Christian country, declaring that her rights as a woman have been bestowed upon her, in a sense, by Islam, or, or in advance, you know, upon women in general. She's declaring a kind of debt, a, a civilizational debt, again, uh, to Islam. She also declares that Islam upholds a complete equality between people. This is not true. In Islam, women are inferior, slaves are inferior, and non-Muslims are inferior. But she denies that. So again, denial is one of the characteristics of the abused system, the abused person, and the gratitude. And she also humiliates herself by implying that she owes this debt, her civilization owes these debts to Islam. She's actually putting Christianity or, or, or Europe on a lower, lower footing. Um, the speech, I understand, was written by one of her Muslim advisors, a speechwriter, who said, you're speaking to all these Muslims, this will sound good to them. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the actual process of, of the subversion of the discourse is very complex. How does our language get changed? Well, through lots of interesting processes. But the point is that the driver of the change is this very deep asymmetry between Islam and non-Islam and the expectation of Islam that non-Muslims owe a debt to Islam. Um, just as an aside, have you ever heard the idea that Islam rescued Greek civilization and classical learning through the Dark Ages. And it was through the translation of Islamic sources that European scholars were really acquainted with the, with the glories of Greek civilization. It's a very interesting idea, you know, um, that, that Greek civilization needed to be rescued by conquest. And it was only because it was conquered that Europe gained the benefit from it. Imagine if, um, if you said, well, the, the, the glories of Hinduism only survived in the world because the, the British conquered India and they preserved Hinduism and, and Hindu texts and that's, um, you know, that's why we, we have Hinduism today. It's a very strange idea, but it's taught to your children in schools. Lots of textbooks teach this. In fact, um, engagement with classical learning happened because of the conquest of Constantinople and the fleeing, or at least one factor was the fleeing of a number of Byzantine Greek scholars into uh, the uh, northern uh, uh, Italian states, Florence, for example, and Venice, and that triggered off, began to trigger off the Renaissance. So it's, um, this idea of rescue by conquest is, a, is, a very, is the, actually the meaning of the dhimma, that you're, when you're conquered, you're rescued, your life is rescued, you owe your life. And not only your life, but all of your civilization is, is being rescued by conquest as well. Um, another example of gratitude and inferiority coming through as themes was in the Yale response to the common word. This is a letter, a common word letter written by Muslims to the Christian world and a group of Yale Christians invited many other Christian leaders to sign a letter. It's amazing the stellar people they got to sign it. But what really struck me and interested me about the letter in the context of my studies is that they, they invoke the, the regular dhimmi themes of inferiority and gratitude humility and gratitude. Many Christians have been guilty of sinning against our Muslim neighbors. We are guilty. We ask forgiveness of the All-Merciful One, I think that's Allah, and of the Muslim community around the world. Now the Muslims had made no such concessions. They didn't ask for forgiveness in their common word letter. In the generosity with which this letter is written, you embody what you call for. Islam is generous to us, and you are embodying uh, this generosity. Uh, it's with humility and hope that we receive your generous letter. Now this is a real challenge, in a sense, for the call to humility in engaging with Islam. 
And I really believe that the people that did this are very deep Christians and they felt they were being Christ-like when they wrote that. But the problem is, on the Islamic side, it actually fits hand in glove into an expectation of inferiority and gratitude. And it's understood in a different way. Now, the Imitude was ended. Um, the Ottomans cancelled it and a lot of countries were invaded. I said there was a backlash as well, but some people like the Greeks got to a degree uh, some freedom. Um, the Serbs also, but there's still, you know, there's still a lot of uh, problems in the Balkans as a result of those divisions. Uh, some groups uh, suffered tremendously. The Assyrians and the Armenians had suffered great massacres in the early part of the century and the Assyrians are still um, dying a lot as well uh, in Iraq. But what happened in the last 80 years is an Islamic revival. So Pakistan went from a secular state, its founding father was an atheist, to progressive Islamization, more and more Islam, more and more Sharia law, worsening conditions for Christians. The Pakistani flag has a strip next to the flagpole, which is for the non-Muslims. And sometimes they'll, they'll say, you know, we are holding up the flag. But they, they in, introduced that flag when they became independent. There's no way they would do that today. Uh, because Christians are in a very minor position. They are the sweepers and the cleaners, and um, they find it very, very difficult, increasingly difficult. They certainly know what it means to be a humble Christian because it's forced upon them by uh, uh, an increasingly hostile and uh, tough environment in which to function. And sadly, the rest of the world, the Christian West, is largely uh, indifferent, I think, to these dynamics because to understand them would mean engaging with Islam in the ways I've described. Otherwise, you don't understand fully what's happening. Interestingly, the human rights uh, scene is quite important. The, the United Nations of, of Muslim countries, the organization of the Islamic Conference, has written a competing declaration of human rights to compete with the Universal Declaration. It's called the, the, um, the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights in Islam, signed by um, the, the, the foreign ministers of the Islamic Conference, which is like a UN of Muslim nations. And interestingly, this, this statement of human rights declares that human rights, as in this statement, are subject to the Sharia. And the Sharia is the only source of reference for the explanation or clarification of this declaration. Now, the Sharia is the path of Islam, and it includes the Dhimma Pact, strictly speaking. So what this is saying is that dhimmitude and the ill treatment of non-Muslims is part of human rights in Islam. This has been promulgated at the UN as one of the, you know, the human rights instruments of the international environment. And the OIC has been lobbying very hard to get the UN to bring in um, uh, uh, motions uh, making defamation of religion, as they call it, illegal, incitement illegal, basically to impose uh, dhimmi-like restrictions on freedom of speech. An example of what's happened in Dearborn would be you know, what they'd like to achieve is to, is, to, is to stop that kind of thing happening, people witnessing to Muslims in the West. Now, in the 20th century, probably you could say communist societies were the worst persecutors of Christians. Uh, many tens of millions suffered greatly. Um, today, though, the lists of uh, nations that uh, are persecuting Christians, that groups like Open Doors and others, Voice of the Martyrs, keep uh, Muslim countries are by far and away the majority of them. And what's interesting is that the, the, the patterns of the persecution universally track the impact regulations. So if you were to look at a country and say, how are Christians doing badly in a Muslim country? All the things they're struggling with are manifestations of the underlying Sharia system. Restrictions on church building, kidnapping of women, attacks on Christians not prosecuted. They're not prosecuted because their testimony is invalid against the Muslims. Um, bans against witnessing, penalties against apostates, people leaving Islam. These are all related to the Dhimma system. So, even though it might not technically be on the books, in Indonesia is not even an Islamic state, nevertheless it shapes society, cultural values, influences law. Now, what I'm going to do is um, talk about theology, Christian theology, and um, in a moment or two I'm going to ask you, invite you to stand and we'll go through some prayers together. Um, I've, if you'd like to, I've had a ministry in the last few years, uh, perhaps we could, this is